Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Wednesday Night Photo Show with Dan's Camera City, our weekly meet and greet to sit for a bit and chat about photography. My name is Scott. Uh, I run the photo classes and outings and stuff here at Dan's, and we've got a fantastic guest for you tonight. We've got a great show lined up. Uh, Buddy Elazer is with here is with us here tonight to talk about his wildlife photography. Uh, he's an astoundingly accomplished photographer, uh, runs his own photo tour company called Magnum Excursions, and uh, let him tell you a little bit more about that. And um, so what's this photography look like anyway? So let's, uh, let's take a quick look and then I'll bring him on the show. How are you? Hi, Scott. How's it going? <laughs> really good. It's great to have you on. Thanks for joining us tonight. My pleasure. I love right, talking so to photography and I love talking to Africa. I love talking wildlife. So this is all good. Wonderful. Yeah. And your your images are fantastic. Those are some just a, for those of us, for those of you who haven't seen any of Buddy's stuff before, and this is your first time seeing him, he's a longtime friend of Dan's. We've had him in for a couple of different talks and, uh, it's always just such a pleasure to see his photos. So um, why don't you tell us a little about yourself? Uh, when, how did you get started in photography? What kind of piqued your interest and in? how did you get to where you are now? Yeah, it's a, sort of an interesting story. I, I took photography in college, but that was back in the 70s uh, with film, of course. Um, and, you know, in that photography course, I really gravitated toward landscapes. I came from a rural setting where I grew up. And so okay. it, this was natural to shoot nature. Mm -hmm. And um, and then uh, 2003, 2004, digital came and I was at a meeting uh, from my company. I retired from Air Products and someone pulled mm -hmm. out a DSLR to take a picture of, uh, of something in the lab. And it's like, ooh, <laughs> <you're>, <laughs> this is different. <laughs> And then, um, you know, so I started shooting landscapes in the Lehigh Valley. Um, I'm going to share mm -hmm. one in just a minute on the slides. And um, and that was what I was doing. And I was loving it. When I traveled with business, I would take my camera with me and I would shoot landscapes. And uh, and then my son uh, graduated college in 2006. So and you had kind of, I'm sorry, like you would, I'm seeing these fantastic pictures and you would kind of taken photography, but then set it aside for 20, 30 years. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I had to work and raise a family. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I, I didn't shoot anything uh, from 1980 to 2003, probably. Um, and that first digital SLR is really what kind of... Oh, yeah, that changed back in. for sure. Yeah. Wow. And uh, and then I was shooting you know, landscapes and, and my kids playing sports. Mm -hmm. And that was... Basically, I was happy doing that. I, you know, I was always looking for a place where there wasn't an aluminum siding house in the distance to get a more <laughs> natural look in this area. And it's not so right. easy. Yeah. And uh, and I travel a lot in business, and so I would take my camera with me then too. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I was mentioning, uh, my son loves nature also. And when he graduated college, and I asked him, "What would you like for a graduation gift?" Well, he gave me a list. But one of the things he also <laughs> said was he'd love to go to Africa. I'm like, well, okay. I'd, I'd like to go too. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'd like to go to Africa. Sure. Why not? Sure. <laughs> uh, but I happen to have a friend from work whose dad uh, led what they call self-drive uh, safaris over there. A self-drive trip is when you basically get in a pickup or a SUV and you go into the bush and uh, do your own thing. And then you meet up with other people every night at dinner, but basically you're on your own. So with no knowledge of wildlife, <laughs> no understanding of whether I would have a gun or anything like that, which I didn't. Uh -huh. uh, 
we took off for Africa and drove a pickup truck um, through Toby National Park. Uh, it had its days. I had a flat tire and a buffalo herd. I got stuck in the sand next to a pride of lions. It was rough. <laughs> so, like, you didn't have a guide with you or anything? You were just like... No, I thought we were going, like, caravan style through the bush. And it uh -huh. turns out South Africans are very independent people, and they all want to do their own thing. So wow. we had to. Um, so we you had really got thrown in the deep end. Yeah, so we had so much fun, we decided to do it again the next year. And after that, I was hooked. And so the, how long have you been doing this now that you've been returning to Africa? Well, I skipped a year or two around 2008, you know, 2010, somewhere in there. But other than that, uh, I've been going continuously. I started Magnum Excursions when I retired, which was 2009. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I did was because I had more and more friends that wanted to go with me on these safari trips. And I thought, well, from a logistics and maybe a discount, you know, if I create a company, an LLC, uh, that would work out better. Okay. So, so that's what I did. And so I go, my, my goal is to go three to five times a year and take oh, wow. groups of six to 10 people. Oh, so that's a tiny little group. Yeah. Now we've taken groups as large as 28, mm -hmm. um, where we took the entire lodge and all the vehicles and all the boats. And, and that was great, but that was a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, most of my trips are, you know, eight to 12. Um, and due to COVID, I've had some postponements. So sure. next year I'll be in Africa for about 16 weeks, which is more than I want to, but oh, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are worse uses for your time. That doesn't sound too terrible. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, I love it. I mean, <laughs> I'm a different person when I'm in the bush. You know, it, I, I relax more. Um, I get an appreciation for the timelessness of, of life. Um, I, I just love it. Yeah. And that uh, your photos kind of speak to that. It, they really do have that sort of, I don't know, like timeless quality. I think that's a good way to put it. Like Thank time you. seems to move differently in those photos. Yeah. Well, again, I think my landscape influence comes into play a lot. You know, I, I do a lot of what I call sense of place shots, which you'll see a little bit later. Okay. Um, you know, I like animals and I also like the environment that they're in. So I, I tend to incorporate the two together. Nice. Okay. That's, that's an interesting approach. Like I can see like not just the animal, but the animal in its landscape and the habitat and yeah. the atmosphere that I get in some of these photos is really like, yeah, I guess sense of place is a great way to put it. You know, it kind of places you in that environment. Yeah. And I still try to find, you know, I mean, just today I was out at Middle Creek. I mean, I, whenever there's an opportunity for wildlife around here, I'm still very interested. I go to the Jersey Shore. You mm -hmm. know, I go to Florida uh, sometimes. Um, COVID has slowed things down. Like I say, I'm so happy that the ice is melting at Middle Creek and the snow geese are back. Oh, yeah. How's it looking out there? Lots of birds. Um, it's oh, yeah. still on ice, but, but my guess is it was probably 30,000 birds there today. I didn't get any great shots. You know, it uh -huh. wasn't one of those days that you got the massive blast off coming straight towards you. But I had right. a lot of fun. I got out there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I know I was talking to somebody who was there a couple of weeks ago and there was still ice over everything and there was hardly any activity going on at all. So yeah. it's good to know that uh, it's and picking up. I got to use the new Olympus 5400 while I was there. Eat your heart out, guys. There it is. <laughs> So in terms of full frame equivalent, what is that? Uh, that's That would be 300 to 800 with an internal 1.2 teleconverter that takes it to 1,000. Holy moly. From 300 to 800, it's f4.5. Mm -hmm. And then at, at, with the teleconverter engaged, it goes to 5.6. That is not bad. How's it no, working it, out for you? Yeah, I mean, that's what I like about it is, is you know, when you go to four thirds uh, mirrorless systems, you lose a little bit in upper end ISO because you're not shooting a big sensor. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the lenses are f2.8, again, this is f4.5, whereas the new Canon's coming out, for example, or the, the Sony that's a zoom that's smaller but similar, they're mm -hmm. two or three stops slower. And, and so you pick up, you know, the equivalent of ISO by having 
lower stop f stop. I haven't right. You're just pulling in more light. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, we haven't gotten our hands on that one yet. That's a a brand new toy, huh? Yeah, and I, this is not mine, by the way. It, it is actually on loan. But uh, I have talked to Olympus, and this month they're beginning to ship them out to to stores like yours. So hopefully your clients will be getting them very very soon. Hopefully we'll be getting them soon. I, I was thing. I was popular at Middle Creek. I probably had six people come up to me and say, "Can I hold it?" <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, most popular guy at the lake. Nice. <laughs> Pity I didn't get any shots. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I see we've got a decent sized audience tonight. Thanks for joining us, everybody. And if you're catching this on the replay, thank you for joining us as well. But uh, while we're talking tonight, if you've got questions, if you've got comments, uh, we will throw some of these up here and uh, we can get some feedback from you. Flo Rutherford says his photos are unbelievable. Yeah. For real, they are. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Flo. Oh, you've got a fan. I've been to Africa with Buddy. It's a first class experience. Quality a level not seen anymore. Well, there's a glowing endorsement, isn't it? John's a good guy. He lives down in Florida. So we have a, a people from all over showing showing up tonight. Nice. Well, thanks for bringing your audience here with us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> So what is it about these trips? I guess it's part of it is that you're running these sort of very small groups, right? It is. You know, the idea is, again, that, that um, you're, it's not like, there's my sister. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> the, the whole idea is that, you know, we have fewer people on the vehicle. We okay. stay longer at the sightings because if you're on a tourist trip, there'll be somebody in the middle seat, for example. And if you're a photographer and you're oh, yeah. that seat or trying to shoot across them, it'd be problematic. Right. But by getting small boutique lodges and getting the whole place, we can have fewer people on the vehicle so everybody can put their gear down and everybody gets a clean shot. Also, we really coach the, the, the rangers, the, the, the guides that we have, mm -hmm. uh, for unobstructed views. You know, like if there's a limb in the way, we back up the vehicle a little bit and get the limb out of everybody's way. Mm -hmm. And then last but probably most important is – we're not trying to check off every animal and say we saw it. We're trying to get photos. So if we find lions and they're sleeping, we don't say, okay, you saw a lion, let's go find a giraffe. We sort of mark the spot and say at sunset when they start moving, when things get active, let's come back here and see if we can catch them on the oh. hunt. So that's oh, why interesting. a little bit more, you know, looking straight at the animal type shots as opposed to butt shots and tired animals. Uh-huh. So part of it is kind of like scouting things out and then you can come back later. Yeah. Nice. Oh, we've got a question. Was it when you retired that you could really devote your life to your photography? I was getting pretty serious about it when I was still working, but no, mm -hmm. I, I could not spend the hours with it then that I can now. I had a mm -hmm. very full job. I mean, it sounds like you got a pretty full job now. That's a very loose definition of the word retirement. <laughs> I actually spoke at the Air Product Retiree Group, and one of my fellow workers said I had the best retirement job he's ever heard of. <laughs> I'm yeah, forced to go to Africa 12 weeks next year. Yeah, I mean, really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I know you've got some uh, some tips and some ideas prepared for us. So why don't we take a look at, like, when you're planning for a trip, like, what is that, what's that process look like? Like, I've never been to, you know, Kenya or Botswana. I've never been out of North America. What's it, what's my process look like for even starting to prepare for a trip like that? Well, that's a good question. And, and that's why you go again with somebody that's been before, because you need to know what season to go. And depending on what animal you're most wanting to see, you need to know, you know, which lodges and which reserves might have a chance of those animals. Mm -hmm. For example, if you really want to see cheetah, you would not go to Chobe National Park. Um, but if you wanted to see wild dog, maybe you would go to uh, Madikwe or you would go to the Okavango Delta. So it, it depends on what you're wanting to see as to where you go. Oh, I guess that kind of answers this question here. Do you only go to Chobe Park or do you visit others? No. I, Sounds like you do a bunch. Yeah. In um, in end of April, I'll be going to the Masa Mara um, to photograph uh, in the, the off season, in the green season, because we're trying to get more dramatic pictures with rain pelting animals and lightning in the background. So that'll be a very unique shot. 
Uh, um, July will be Namibia. Uh, two weeks in southern Namibia, which will be mostly landscapes, some wildlife. Mm -hmm. And then September will be the Mossamara's Great Migration. Um, I'm focusing on East Africa this year because of COVID, because East Africa's got less of a problem than Southern Africa. Um, but next year, um, I've got three weeks at a reserve called Zamanga in Southern Africa. I've got a, a week, two weeks, in a place called Timbavati, which is part of the Kruger National Park. Okay. Uh, one week at Chobe and two weeks in the Okavango Delta. Uh, and at the Okavango, staying at three different lodges. So, so yeah, I, I sort of go... A little of everywhere. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, that doesn't sound like a bad way to spend your retirement at all. <laughs> oh, interesting question. Are you printing many images? And when you do, what do you print on and who prints your images? Well, to look at the wall behind you, I'm going to guess, guess that you're doing a fair amount of prints. <laughs> I, um, I, I don't print as much. You know, it's amazing. Um, Galleries were a big deal when I first got into these trips, and, and I sold a number of pictures at galleries and, and online. But these days, you know, galleries have sort of gone uh, a thing of the past, and more and more people are viewing online. So I, I don't print near as much, but uh, I, I like printing large. A lot of the prints I do now are 42 inches. Um, oh, wow. Okay. And, you know, I, I uh, like printing on acrylic. I like printing on metal. Mm -hmm. um, as a value statement, these behind me are on canvas and I, I love printing on canvas because it's an inexpensive way to get a large print. Um, but I also have, uh, the Epson P900, I think it's called the 17 inch. Epson oh yeah. Print. yeah. And, and I do my own printing for anything up to 17 inches. Nice. Yeah. That's a, a really decent little printer that produces some fantastic. It is uh, I'm very happy with the quality of it. Oh, we've got a bunch of questions. Oh, nice. I assume you know Jason. <laughs> yeah, Jason was at Middle Creek today. Um, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do some well, like clothing packing list. Uh, I let them understand the weather. Um, I give them a camera and electronics packing list. Like a lot of people want to just bring an iPad because they don't think they'll take that many pictures. But on Safari, if you have a good day, you're going to shoot over a thousand shots in this digital age, especially with these cameras that have high frame rates. So, oh, you know, yeah. you need to bring a laptop. You need to bring an external hard drive, for example, a solid state or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so people need to know that stuff before they go over there. So I do try to prep people what it's like. Um, oh, that's great. You know, when the people traveling are local, we usually have a kickoff party. Um before the event so that everybody can ask questions and we can sort of meet each other before we actually are over there. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that I think helps break the, the ice a little bit. Yeah. Cause I imagine like, it sounds fantastic. Like I would love to go, but it also sounds like it could be a little nerve wracking for like, I've never been there before. I don't know what to pack. I don't know what to expect. And like to have somebody to kind of guide you through that process, even before you leave the country sounds like a real, Real good yeah. thing to have. Yeah, and again, knowing when to go is really important. Um, for example, um, a lot of people worry about um, insects and things like that. Well, mm -hmm. that's why we go in you know June, July, August, September, because Southern Africa has rains in December, January, and February, but then they really don't have any rain to speak of anymore until the following November. And so it just gets drier and drier and drier. And as it gets drier, there's no water for mosquitoes to lay their eggs. Uh, the insects gotcha. disappear. It's also their winter months. And winter for them means nights can get down to 40 or 50. So the insects tend to not be there in those right. months. Okay. Whereas if you go in January, you know, you, you'll see more insects. Interesting. Oh, there's the question. <laughs> One <laughs> average cost with it. You somebody was gonna ask. <laughs> yeah, it depends on how long you're going. Um, you know, I try to again, part of my whole goal is to get people to Africa and get them that experience. And mm -hmm. again, depending on the group size and whether you're going to the Okavango or whether you're going to to Zamanga, the prices vary. Um mm -hmm. thirty five hundred dollars for a week is doable. Um, but then again, if you're going to the Okavango Delta, it can be $800 a night. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on how long you're staying and where you're going. 
Namibia is the best value. It's the least expensive of the bunch. Um, Oak Van Gogh is the most expensive. All right. Hmm. Gotta start saving my pennies. I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you think about a trip to to Disney World, it's really not that different. In oh Brooklyn. yeah, it's it, it actually. I'm kind of surprised. It seems pretty reasonable, actually. And airfares typically, you know, and, and that price I, I quoted, by the way, includes all your meals, includes you know uh, all your internal oh. transfers and flights inside of Africa. Um, as well as, you know, the, the fees for the reserves and all that kind of stuff. So that's all inclusive. Um, airfares run as low as $700, as high as $1,700 for coach class. Mm -hmm. um, and there are direct nonstop flights to South Africa from now Newark and JFK. And there's direct nonstop mm -hmm. flights to Kenya, to Nairobi from JFK. That's actually a lot more achievable than I, uh, than I would have thought. That's interesting. Yeah, and that's another thing we do, you know, when it's a local group, we basically pull together to go over, you know, in a, a limo, I have a limo service I use, and then we split the call. So nobody has to worry about leaving a car at the airport. And then we're all, all right. possible on the same flight so that we're, when we arrive, there's no surprises. If, mm -hmm. if I'm not on the same flight with others, then I fly in before them so that I can meet them at the airport when they arrive. Nice. No, that really does sound like you've really kind of taken care of the whole thing so that well, I, I, kind of minimize worry for people. Exactly. You were talking about being nervous about going over there. And that's that was how I felt. I mean, I was overwhelmed my first trip. And and yet I also remember golf outings I had to Jamaica where somebody handled everything and all I had to do was buy a plane ticket. And mm -hmm. that was a great experience. So I wanted to create that kind of an experience. Awesome. All right. So um you want to take a look at some pictures? Sounds good. I want to take a look at some pictures. Okay. Um, I've got to hit share screen, right? Yep. You've got your, it should already be in there. Oh, is it already sharing? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. We're cool. Yeah. So we were talking about the Choby River and um, often when we go, we stay on this houseboat in the river itself so that we can get away from all the other peoples and feel more remote. So this is a five bedroom houseboat. You can see the five doors on the lower deck and the dining room area is up above. And, um, and each day we go out to photograph in these photo boats, like you see on the right there. So that's they, where you're living. Yeah, that's, that's our, that's our life. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And they have amazing meals, by the way, it's delicious. Um, and then we shoot from these boats you see on the right. There are these flat bottom boats that are about 40 feet long that have eight inline seats so that everybody can swivel 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. The seats have gimbals attached to them so that, you know, your lens is supported while you're photographing. And, um, and we can go into really shallow water, very, very shallow draft boats. But that's Chobe, you know, other reserves that go on land. So you were asking how I got started. <laughs> well, back in 2005, I'd been taking landscapes and my girlfriend, said, um, you know, you're pretty good. You entered that contest at a promenade, I think. You, you have a chance. I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to enter mine. And she said, do it. If you don't do it, I'm going to take the camera back because she bought the camera for me. <laughs> um, so I entered, and I won. And Dan's was uh, was the sponsor. And um, they yep. gave me this yeah. print mounted on a, on a foam board um, at about 16 by 20, I believe. Uh, mm -hmm. It's still hanging in my guest bedroom, and that was my first win. That's what, you know, I, I remember this photo because I remember running the photo contest and we did all the material for it. And uh, I didn't, I didn't connect the dots. I didn't realize that was you until you just sent me this the other day. Like, oh yeah, I recognize that photo. By the way, uh, an interesting trivia thing. My sister, you know, asked a question a minute ago. I was on my cell phone talking to her when these geese flew by and I clicked that shutter. I was standing up here with my <laughs> tripod and she called me on my cell phone and I clicked this picture. <laughs> Well, this, I'm glad this it worked out well Canon, for you. Canon, uh, the original di uh, Canon Rebel. Oh, Rebel. okay. So this was a while ago. Yeah. Yeah, like 2005, I guess that would have been. Yeah. And then this is probably one of my most famous shots that I've won the most international competitions with. This one's won six or seven awards. Um, 
and uh, it was taken from a helicopter. Uh, that's an oryx crossing the top of a 600 foot tall sand dune in Namibia. And um, I just happened to catch that early morning light where, you know, the shadows were great and yeah. the shadows were sliding down that hillside for me. So what is it that got you like, do you just go out looking for contests now? Um, and what's the, I guess what's kind of the motivation of like, I'm going to enter photo contests? Well, as I mentioned, I work for our products. That in itself means I'm a very competitive um, type A individual, I guess. And I always want to get feedback on what people see in my pictures and also how I rate relative to the world of photography, I guess. And, okay. you know, I don't have to win, but I, I want that feedback and I want comments. Um, I entered a couple of contests um, last year that, that the judges sent me notes. I didn't win, but they sent me notes on what they liked about it or did, or where I could have improved. Mm -hmm. And that, that drives me. So I do enter, um, I, I don't enter local competitions much anymore, but I do enter um, Wildlife Photographer of the Year, which is the British Museum of Natural History. I enter the Smithsonian. I enter uh, Nature's Best, which is a, an international contest run out of the United States. I enter um, the Big Picture, which is run by the California Academy of Science. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's one that's jointly sponsored by uh, NANPA and the Denver Audubon Society that's called um, Share the View, and I enter that one too. Wow. And how are you doing? I always am a semifinalist, and um, and sometimes I'm a finalist. Uh, many honorable mentions and a couple of wins. This one's um, this one's won me a couple of nice prizes. Not bad. This one was also in a number of newspapers and magazines. Um, uh, you know, they picked up when you win in a contest, the pictures end mm -hmm. up in a magazine, and then they contact you and they ask for the background of the of the picture and all that. Mm -hmm. Well, let me move on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Itosha in uh, northern Namibia. And um, this one, I was actually with uh, a group of only four people traveling. Two of them from the Lehigh Valley, uh, Shirley Billheimer and Michelle Costum were in the vehicle with me. And then ahead of me in another vehicle was my sister that was just on the line and, and three other people. And um, we were just heading for our lodge and we saw this line of zebra that we were coming up from behind on and mm -hmm. it stretched forever so we decided we would try to drive past it get ahead of it and shoot looking back at it that was over a kilometer single file zebras this close for over a kilometer it was amazing Holy. yeah i like what you like what's going on here with the very high key lately, I've been, photo. lately I've been shooting a lot of high key again for competition you can't, you, they want it more natural. You can do mm -hmm. black and white, but it needs to be more natural. And you can't remove any elements, no cloning, no removing things it, other than dust bunnies. So, mm -hmm. so what you're seeing is more my art side as opposed to my competition side with, with many of these you'll see tonight. I got a question about how much editing you do. Uh, again, uh, I'm right. very good at Photoshop. <laughs> and again, <laughs> for competitions, I don't edit. This mm -hmm. picture is merely a crop and a curves adjustment, for example. Okay. Um, but as you can imagine, I'm shooting eight to 10 frames per second. So this was the one frame that I liked all the curves and, and, and detail on. The others were less attractive to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, it takes me five minutes to edit a picture. You know, I don't spend 30 minutes on it. Um, but my natural move always is to set a white point and a black point, adjust the curve, um, if I need noise reduction, I do noise reduction. I use Topaz, uh, uh, AI denoise to, to take okay. noise out of it. And yeah. then, uh, if I'm going to convert black and white, I use, um, DXO's Nick, uh, silver effects. And, okay. Yeah. And basically that's my process. I'm that's really, I'm, I really like both of those tools. So it's, it's yeah. kind of nice to get a little confirmation that those are the, the ones that you like too. And they're pretty user friendly too. You know, they, yeah. there's a quick learning curve on them. I don't use the, you know, there's presets off to the left side and I'll maybe look at those to get a feel for where the picture can go. But mm -hmm. I mostly use sliders to do the fine tune adjustments. All right. So um, this gets me into my two slides that I tell you I wanted to give. 
And because I know that you guys are running a, a trip to Lakota Wolf Preserve in a little bit. And so I wanted to let people sort of think how would they want to shoot that. And what I find is so many people say, OK, well, let's go out and shoot birds today. Mm-hmm. But they haven't a clue as to what exactly they want to bring home. So I have a methodology that I preach on my safaris. And again, this is my only bullet slide. But <laughs> first thing I do is I look for action. And if action's happening, okay. skip the rest of the stuff. You want to capture the action. Um, and then I take what I call the safe shot. And I'll give an example of all these. But it's basically a nice composition, rule of thirds or whatever, that I can take home. I'm not embarrassed with the picture. If I get no more pictures before the animal moves, I can still share this. And I feel like, you know, I captured the moment. But once I have mm-hmm. that, then I look for gesture. Gesture to me is the nod of the head, the hand coming to the mouth, the swish of the tail, the mud coming up with the elephant, anything like that. And I related to that is storytelling. You know, if there's interaction between two animals in particular, there's storytelling opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't go over this tonight, by the way, but but I mentioned two animals. A big mistake a lot of people make is if there's, let's say, a whole herd of elephants, you shoot those as a group and you get a blob of elephants. You don't really get any definition and, and you, it's hard to shoot a group of animals tight together. So I always look for the animals on the fringes that are sort of single or separated so that I can get oh. some separation between the animals. Right. Uh, and then I go to my favorite sense of place, mm-hmm. uh, which again, we will get into that a little bit more. I take a portrait and then I zoom in tight and look for details and, uh, little bitty things that remind me of the animal. Maybe it's the hoof. Maybe it's it's the eyelash. You know, it can be anything. And after that, I get real creative. In particular for me, and if you've ever been on safari with me, you'll know this. I keep uh, one of my custom settings always at one fifteenth of a second shutter priority and auto ISO, uh, no, minimum ISO, mm-hmm. um, so that I can do pan shots. And I'm big on pan shots. I'm big on rim lighting and back lighting. So you'll see mm-hmm. a lot of those on my more creative stuff. So when action happens, again, you got these these hippos fighting. You don't say, okay, well, I need to get a sense of play shot. You, you shoot tight and you get the action. <laughs> gotcha. so this yeah. is Ollie Baboon, and these, these guys are going at it, and they're fighting. And, you know, yeah, it's a beautiful vista behind them, and I'll shoot that later after the fight's over. Mm-hmm. But you want to get that action because, you know, nothing's more powerful than action in your shots. Right. Um. Here I was shooting pan shots of wildebeest moving left to right uh, at about 100 meters away. It was a nice calm scene. They were almost walking. So I was down to a tenth of a second because they were moving so slow. And then the whole herd panicked and ran straight at my vehicle. I couldn't change my camera setting, so I just clicked away. <laughs> and I ended up with a lot of dynamic energy here. Um, and this was actually yeah, a finalist like- with the uh, Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Wow. I mean, because that looks like, I mean, do you get nervous about that when there's a, what are these wildebeest charging at you? There's only a thousand of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you're in a vehicle. You're, you know, we didn't talk about that, but I don't, get, you know, clients stay in the vehicle unless the guide says it's safe and we're going to take a coffee break or something and get out of the vehicle. Uh-huh. And, and I trust my rangers and I'm in a vehicle. So, no, I don't get nervous anymore. You know, the first trips, yes, I did. But uh, <laughs> like, I imagine you're feeling the ground shaking when they're like, that's got to, what's the noise like when they start moving like that? Well, the first thing goes to my mind is why did they do that? And in this particular case, and, and I didn't share this picture with them, but a leopard jumped into the middle to take down uh, a young wildebeest. And when that leopard got in the middle of that herd, everything went crazy. Holy moly. But this is a safe shot. You know, it's it's nothing wrong with these pictures. As a matter of fact, they're 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 very nice pictures. But it's like, mm-hmm. okay, there's an animal. He's in a tree. There's a baby on the ground. These are uh, chakma baboons. Uh, this is on the Chobe River, by the way, from the boat. Um, you know, you try to catch a catch light. You look for a leading line or a diagonal, and you just you get that one shot that you know, okay, I've got that one. Now let me do something a little more interesting. Yeah, I see what you mean. Like this is the like it's. You know, it's a perfectly good picture. I would be thrilled with one of these. And we've got like the the little one making eye contact with the camera there. But I can see like looking at some of your other stuff that like this is sort of your baseline almost, right? 
it is for me at this stage. But it's again, it's it's a picture that that I share on Facebook. I, I I don't you know the one on the right in particular with the the mother and baby. I would print that. The other one I probably wouldn't print, but at the same time, it's a nice documentation shot of, of what a chakma baboon looks like. Okay. Yeah. They have great eyes, by the way. Um, and then I look for gesture here. You know, there's a baby baboon under the mom looking up at um, at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, that's a more interesting picture than the previous ones. Now, these guys don't look real big. How, like, what kind of lens, what kind of gear are you dealing with here? Uh, well, this one was shot actually with the Olympus 300, which is 600 millimeter equivalent. And okay. it was at, at my lodge in, in Amboseli. This is, um, this is an olive baboon. Um, and I was actually laying on the grass as they were walking toward me and around me. It was a troop of baboons, and it was lunchtime midday, and I was, which is part of why I converted to black and white. And, uh, you know, they were just doing their thing as they walked past. Oh, wow. So they were pretty close. Um, I didn't have to crop this or anything. That's why the tail is cut off. But they were just animals foraging, walking along. It was nothing exciting going on other than, you know, looking at the babies. Mm -hmm. but yeah, but that little yeah, gesture, that interaction is really what makes it, right? Yeah, but you were asking about lenses, and that's a good question for anybody going on safari. If you're going to southern Africa, mm -hmm. which means Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Zambia, we get – so close to the animals that, that a 100, 400 on a full frame equivalent is plenty of lens. Really? Um, you know, yeah, the, the, the Canon 1.4 is like the workhorse for me when I was shooting Canon. Hmm. If, you, if you're going to Tanzania or Kenya, the animals are a little further off and a lot of the parks don't allow you to go off road. So that's where the 500, 600 millimeter comes to play a lot more. Gotcha, okay. So that actually ties into a question from Jim here. With limitations on gear, weight, and size, do you want at least two bodies? Like how much, how many lenses are you carrying? What's a what's your packing list look like there? Yes, with I travel restrictions. Two bodies. On my second trip to Africa, uh, I was with my son and I were in a vehicle with another couple. Actually, we were on a boat with another couple, and he had one camera. It was a film camera in those days, and it died on him. And oh, so for the rest of that safari, he basically was a viewer. Um, you take two, you never yeah. know. And, and I had, you know, I had a 5D Mark II um, mm -hmm. that I took to uh, Victoria Falls. And Victoria Falls has a lot of spray coming off of the, the waterfall. It's twice the height of Niagara Falls and four times the width. Um, and so there's a lot of spray there. And it destroyed that camera. I took it straight home, put it in rice. Yeah you know, tried to get it working again. Uh -huh. That's why I have insurance on my equipment. Um, but no, I, I take two bodies. Uh -huh. um, again, I'm shooting micro four thirds now, so it's a little bit different, but I'm gonna talk full frame equivalent. Um, it's great to have something in that 100 to 500 range. Um, these new 200, 600s are great, 100, 500 for Canon, 100, 400. And, and with those, I would take a 1.4 teleconverter also. And then mm -hmm. I take something like a 24-105. Okay. And then, and then I take like a 14 millimeter equivalent because you want to shoot the night skies. The stars here are just fabulous. The Milky Way just oh. blows your mind. And, and the Milky Way's in the middle of the Milky Way is the Southern Cross. So that, and you can always see the Southern Cross. So therefore, you can always see the Milky Way. And, um, and you know, you don't have the light pollution. So you mm -hmm. want to shoot the night skies. Yeah, that sounds wow. Okay, this is sense of place. Um, as yeah. you can imagine, you know, with the mountain in the background, that's Kilimanjaro, and you know, these are elephants uh, going to a, a back to their their home at night. Mm -hmm. um, in Amboseli area, the wildlife, especially the elephants, live in the hills at night, and each morning they come down from the hills into the marshlands of Amboseli to graze and drink water and stay cool. And then each evening they go back up into the mountains again. So knowing that you can position yourself at the riverbed, position yourself with Kilimanjaro. Okay. And just wait for them to pass and you know, it's going to happen. Okay. So it's really all about knowing the behavior of the animal, knowing the environment and like how that interaction happens. Yeah. And, and of course the lay of the land there so that you know where you can get the shot and where you can't, because some areas right. could be uh, busy backgrounds or something like that. I love this shot. 
this is one of my of all the stuff that you sent me this one really really stands out to me thank you and the um what's interesting is like you talked about it's tough to photograph animals when they're clumped together and you'll look for the one isolated but here i there's a great like here's this little family group and i think it really it's really worked out well in this shot right yeah, it did here. There was enough separation and enough color difference. By the way, a lot of people have asked me about those black lines on the elephants. Mm -hmm. well, I mentioned to you a minute ago how they come out of the mountains and go into the marsh and spend their day in the water, and then they go back into the hills. Oh, so that's like the water line? That's the water line. Nice. Yep. <laughs> so that's, that's how deep they were in the water. Yep. All right. Uh, this is also in Kenya. This is in a place called Shampoli Wilderness. It's really special. And you could argue that this one is gesture as well as sense of place. For me, the mm -hmm. moment it clicked uh, was when that ox pecker bird flew off the nose of the one uh, giraffe and, and you know, separated from the, the three. Um, yeah. This was heat of the day. You can see by the shadow straight below the trees. So, again, it made a, a nice conversion to black and white. Mm -hmm. Middle of the day works well for going to black and white. And cool. before they ask, I shoot in color and then convert to black and white when I get home. Well, I assume you're shooting raw, right? Yeah, I'm shooting raw. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so why you've got I, all, all the flexibility. People ask me about color balance and all that kind of stuff. I just use the automatics. I'm shooting raw. I'm going to mm -hmm. adjust it to, to my taste when I get home. And it may be cooler or warmer than it actually was, but it's mm -hmm. how my mind saw the scene. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Portrait. Portrait's a portrait. It can be head on or it can be in profile. This mm -hmm. is right at sunset. This is, by the way, with the Olympus EM1, EM1X at 6400 ISO. People say you can't shoot high ISO with that, and you can't. But I cleaned this up with um, uh, DxO's um, noise reduction software. I think it's called mm -hmm. Prime or something like that. And okay. it cleaned up beautifully. Uh, um, I, was, I downloaded a free trial of that software just to play with some images and I intentionally pick some noisy ones. Yeah, they've, like they've kind of made leaps and bounds in noise reduction software between DxOs and uh, Topaz has got one that I was playing around with and yeah. like they're pretty impressive now. Yeah, and it's minor tip, but notice I've got catch light in the eye of the lion. You know, oh, yeah. that, that little bit of glint in the eye of the animal always makes them feel more alive and not so dead. And mm -hmm. it's just a reflection of the, the sun, you know, off to the right. Yeah, good. This looks like a studio shot. It I does a little bit. I, I actually like this shot a lot. Yeah. Um, but here's another portrait. It's the whole animal. It's side lighting, very strong side lighting. This was shot, you know, at 615. The sun came up at six o'clock. I was on the Choby River staying in that houseboat. And, you know, the background was in shadow behind me and was maybe 50 meters away. I mm -hmm. underposed four stops. You know, people tend to, to want to expose for the brightness of the animal. I underexpose a lot when I'm trying to get rim lighting because I want everything else to get in a really dark shadow. And then in post, I actually lowered the shadows a little bit more. And for focus points, when you're shooting with low light like this, mm -hmm. you're looking for contrast. So the edges of the animal where the fur is lit up was my focus point. Uh, otherwise, the camera would have searched trying to focus. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, details, that was the other technique I mentioned here. Um, mm -hmm. The sun was coming at such an angle that, that the eyelash of this elephant lit up, and I knew that was the shot, so I went in tight. Um, I was about 30 meters from this animal. The, the, the elephants get very close to you in, in the vehicles. Um, and people say, how come animals are so skittish here versus Africa? These reserves haven't had any hunting in them other than the occasional poacher. Um, mm -hmm. Since so about the late 50s. And so, you know, when you see a lion, its great grandfather was used to people being around. You know, for generations now, they've seen vehicles. They don't see them as a threat. They don't see them as, as food chain. They just see them as this thing that happens to be in the bush every day. So they're very comfortable and they just totally so kind of. Okay. So that actually ties into a question that we got from the audience. What, like, what's that poaching situation look like? What's what are they doing to prosecute poachers? How do they go about protecting these animals? Well, that's 
part of why I like the private reserves as much as I do is uh, the private reserves are um, fenced to the outside world, but not fenced to the major reserve like, like Kruger National Park, let's say. Um, and they have a, a large portion of the fees I pay to go to those reserves, go to anti-poaching forces that patrol the, the uh, fence lines each night. Um, and they're beginning to get quite sophisticated. They even use infrared drones to fly over those properties at night to, oh, to wow. look for you know people that are in the woods. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is in Southern Africa, the elephants don't have very large tusks. So uh, the poaching is better in Tanz and, Ken, Ken and <laughs> Kenya because they have larger tusk uh, animals. And they've uh -huh. had a real problem with it up there. They're beginning to get uh, control of it, but it, it's been a problem. Now, during the pandemic, everywhere has had a trouble with a different kind of poaching. And that's what they call bush meat, where mm. locals haven't been working for a year and they need to feed their families. So they're setting up snares to catch antelope or warthog or something that they can eat. Mm -hmm. Well, those snares will catch anything. And it can be a lion, it can be a hyena, it can be an elephant's foot. And it does some serious damage to the animals when they're caught in those snares. So that's been the problem during the pandemic. So there's kind of a related question. I'd love to go on one of these excursions, but I think about the pressure on the animals, considering that, how can I justify it? <laughs> well, first <laughs> off, these animals, take Botswana, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, they had certain private conservancies they were selling to hunters and certain ones they had for, for nature lovers. And they found the economics of ecotourism would generate enough money that they didn't have to take fees from hunters. So they got rid of hunting in Botswana totally. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and that's the key is what you're doing is you're saving these animals. The money that you're spending over there justifies the existence of these reserves that are running wild. They're not being fed. They're, they're, they're doing everything just like it was, you know, a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. uh, but they're actually being protected when, um, if, if an injury occurs to an animal that's caused by man, such as those snares I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. then they'll bring in a vet and, and try to help the animal. If the injury is natural due to, let's say, a fight with another, um, like two lions fighting and one gets hurt, uh -huh. it's nature, so they don't touch it. So, I mean, right, that makes they try sense. To, to minimize mankind. The, the gods are true lovers of nature themselves. I mean, they, they do this with a passion. They know mm -hmm. all the animals. They know the gestation periods. They know everything about them. And they, the animals aren't stressed. If you see it, we, we talk about uh, chill and aggro when we're over there. If you see okay. this over here, he's totally chill. You know, he's, you know, eating and, and you know, he's just doing his thing and, and he doesn't even know we exist. Um, sometime you'll get an animal, a young one in particular, that uh, looks aggravated when we get near. Um, mm -hmm. Then we back off. You leave that animal alone. And also in the private reserves, when you have a, what we call a sighting, something like a lion or a leopard, we limit it to two to three vehicles maximum at the sighting. We, you know, in the national park system, just like at Yellowstone, you know, if there's a great sighting, there'll be 20 cars trying to get around it and get a picture of it. In the private reserves and in the conservancies that I go to, they limit mm -hmm. the number of vehicles that are there. And then basically it's an honor system. You, you stay for about 20 to 30 minutes to get your shot. And then you move out and let somebody else come in to take your place. If there's a lineup of people wanting to see it. Um, if nobody's wanting to see it, you can stay there all day with it. Mm -hmm. um, so it really isn't stressing the animals. It's just the opposite of that. Really. It is trying to allow them to do their thing. And, uh, and we're there to observe. We don't, we don't make, we don't, make clicking sounds. We don't throw rocks at them to get their attention. We, we don't bait them. We are there as observers. Right. Yeah. And it sounds like they're really, the whole system sounds like it's really designed to, well, one, protect the animals in their environment. And then and it sounds like everybody's actually really considerate about like going out of their way to not stress the animals and to and it helps the local economy too, because you know in these rural oh, areas sure. there isn't a lot of industry. So if these guys mm -hmm. weren't working as as guides or uh, security or or cooks or or you know all the different uh, things that go with with hotel management, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there would be unemployment. 
Right. Um, when I get into details, by the way, you know, it's not just the head. You know, you look for anything interesting, zebras in particular. These are grevy zebras, which are um, uh, an endangered species. I shot these at Samburu, which is in northern uh, Kenya. Um, but you look for just geometric patterns and designs and details that are interesting. That's that's what I mean by details. Yeah, that's such a those great graphical element. The zebras are fascinating. I tell the you way what, those patterns kind of interact. You know, um, when I go with South Africans, they don't care. They don't they don't care for zebras as a photo opportunity because they're so common there. It's like us stopping to take a picture of a cow in a pasture. <laughs> for Americans, though, really, they're like striped horses from the West or something. We 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 go crazy wanting to photograph zebras. I would say. Yeah. Zebras and giraffe are like top two items of many, many people going over there. Mm -hmm. and, and when it comes to back to the person asking about me selling prints, I've probably sold more zebra prints than any other type. Really? I mean, yeah. it is. It's such a striking visual. Right. Yeah. But yeah, that's I, I mean, there was a we had a, a guest photographer came up um, from Australia and I was out on a photo walk with him and we were doing a workshop. And he was stopping and photographing squirrels. Yeah, yeah. Because he's never seen them before. No, that's right. And yeah, he, if this guy's chasing me down from my bagel, but he would have been going crazy. And he said it's just a kangaroo. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's what you're used to. And then you know, I mentioned also getting creative, and I mentioned I love pan shots. Uh, you know, here's a herd, and again, if I shot this at a sixteen hundredth of a second and froze all these impalas. Uh, mm -hmm. This is actually a harem. These are all females. Um, it would have been an incredibly boring shot. They were just walking across a road. They weren't running or anything interesting. And if I froze it, it would look like a, a clump of impala. But by mm -hmm. shooting, you know, a 20th of a second, a 15th of a second and panning with, you know, my camera focused on the shoulder or the head of, of the one nearest me, mm -hmm. you bring action and dynamics into the picture, you know. You yeah. also blur the background and make it less busy. You know, because How long did it take you to get this down to where you were getting consistently good results with that panning? Because like a 15th of a second, that's kind of a long shutter speed. Yeah, um, I'm better than most because I've tried it more than most. The beauty of digital is you can throw things away. I tell people, you know, if you're shooting 10 or 15 frames per second and you shoot for five seconds, you know, you're going to with 50 or 60 shots. And of those, if you have three keepers, you had a great shoot, you know, I mean, delete the rest. No big deal. Yeah. The other thing is, uh, and, and this is a plug a little bit for Olympus, is the Micro Four Thirds system makes panning easier because oh, yeah. the lens isn't sticking out as far to have to move as far. And in addition to that, everything is lighter. So, so moving it with the animal is an easier effort for me than when I was carrying uh, the, the Canon 1DX Mark II and, and, you know, like a 400 millimeter lens. That was just so heavy that panning mm -hmm. and keeping right on the subject was was a heavier process so you know smaller lighter cameras make painting much much easier it's like turning your head yeah okay right. do you find that the um the olympus image stabilization helps that out too that you can set the the horizontal sure. priority stabilization yeah yeah i mean the image stabilization in general is amazing uh these days with all the cameras but but olympus um you know it was this with, with the combination of the em1 X and the 150-400, I think I have something like, I don't know, seven stops of image stabilization or something crazy <laughs> like that. I mean, yeah, I was happy when I had two. <laughs> <laughs> and again, creative can also mean, again, this is a low key image. Um, mm -hmm. This crocodile was under a bush. Uh, the light was coming from above the bush and bouncing off the back of the crocodile and reflecting in the water. Uh, this was in Medique, and um, and I was in a, a hide they have that, that pops up in the middle of a pond, and so I'm shooting right at water level um, at, at this crocodile that's you know um, just chilling. But again, that's a creative shot. It's, I could have exposed it for the time of day, and mm -hmm. and I don't think it would have been very good. But you know, I mean, that's the beauty of digital. You can play on stuff like this. Yeah. Wets. Nothing, no, you know, nothing excites me more than sunset coming because I know I can get silhouette. So I, I look for a spot where the animal is above the horizon. 
Mm -hmm. And then I just position myself uh, for things to happen. So you kind of downhill from the elephant here, looking well, upward? Yeah, he's on. This is in the Chobe River in this particular shot, and he's on the bank of of the land uh, to the north, which would be actually um, Namibia. Um, and so I'm in those low photo boats I mentioned earlier. So mm -hmm. the bank is maybe at five feet, and he's up on the ridge of that bank. Um, gotcha. But that's one of the keys for silhouettes, and I can show you lots of examples. Unless you've got a reflection on the water, any silhouette, any animal below the horizon that you try to shoot at sunset gets lost in the background. It's just too dark against too dark a background. You, you need them above the, the horizon to be able to create a, a great silhouette in general. Again, mm -hmm. if they're against a, a big body of water where you have a reflection, that'll work too. But Right, to give you that separation. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, we were talking about Beyond Africa, what do I do? This is Yellowstone last year. Uh, I didn't get to go this year because COVID. Um, but Yellowstone in winter is fabulous. It's cold. It's very, very cold. It's like minus 20. And the coyotes, again, are very habituated. They're like the foxes are around here. So you can be, you know, 40 yards away. I think that's, I think you're supposed to be at least 60 feet away as close as you're supposed to get to any animal. Mm -hmm. and you get low in the snow and, you know, you can get out of your vehicle there and get low and and get some amazing uh, wildlife shots in Yellowstone. I would say this is what I would call one of the safe shots. Mm -hmm. That would be what I would also call a safe shot. That's a big horn. And um, we were just driving along, coming back from our lodge. And there's a mountain off to our left. And, and these guys are just grazing their way down the hillside. And we stopped. They came all the way down, crossed the road right in front of our vehicle, and then went into the, the creek bed to our right. It was uh, easy peasy. Wow. This is why I went to Yellowstone. Uh, it's horrible. Oh, horrible. You know, this was minus 20 degrees this morning. And when we heard it was minus 20, we knew to go to where the creeks are really steamy and where that steam will then solidify into ice overnight on the animal oh. fur. And so we rushed into the Lamar Valley to this area where there's uh, a, a stream that always has steam coming off of it. And we found uh, a couple of herds of buffalo there. And um, again, a photo tip. I'm looking down at this animal because, again, the road is above the, the, the um, animals. And mm -hmm. even though I can get out of the vehicle, you don't get out of the vehicle and go down close to buffalo. They're big animals. <laughs> and they, look big. they look like big cows. Uh -huh. They're incredibly powerful, and um, and you don't know how they're going to behave, so you know stay away. But this would be a more powerful shot and more of an award shot if I could have been down at either eye level or below eye level photographing it. Why is that? Well, they just uh, their dimensions seem to stand with more grandeur when you're lower. Okay, so like if you're down looking up right. at them, they. They just look right. bigger and more looking down at it, it, it looks like you're looking down at an animal and it just doesn't have the power. It, it minimizes the animal to some degree. Gotcha. And if this were here and in the grass, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, when you're at a higher angle, the background becomes more of an obstruction too. Uh, whereas when you're low, the background is usually looking further away and you get more of a bouquet or a bouquet or whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, look to a picture. This was snow, so that didn't okay. really matter. Right. Yeah, but I, I like if you get low enough, the background is sky, right? So you've exactly. got exactly okay, exactly. yeah. Back to sense of place for me. I saw this serpentining um, creek, and and that said time to get a picture. <laughs> yeah. Oh moly. Yeah, so that's that really is. It's like landscape that has a buffalo in it, yeah. more than a buffalo picture. And Yellowstone is is by far the Serengeti of America. You know, if you get a chance to go there in the fall or the winter, you know, the wildlife is very thick. In the summer, less. Uh, the beauty of the winter is tourists generally aren't there. Photographers are there, but not tourists because it's cold. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> 20 below yeah. keeps the riffraff out. <laughs> but they all come down from the hills, the, the, the bison congregate, there's red fox, there's coyote. Um, there's bighorn sheep, as you saw earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's an abundance of wildlife. And, you know, you can self-drive it. It's fairly inexpensive to do if you want to. Or you can take one of their snow coaches and go deeper into the park. Um, 
And it's just a beautiful time of the year to go to Yellowstone. And is this just because, like, because of the hot springs and everything that, okay, these areas aren't frozen over. There's access to water here. Is that, like, what attracts them in? Well, that, and there's, underneath that snow is grass. And, and the snow on this particular animal on its face is because they use their head as sort of a, a, a snow plow, if you will, and knock away the snow and, and graze on that grass that's, that's underneath the snow. And that's, that's their okay. source of food in the winter. Yikes. You know, okay. so great time to be there. Uh, this is Florida. This is um, Wakota Hatchie, which is out near um, um, Boca Raton area. Okay. Um, there's three or four fantastic parks there that are tied to the water management system. And they have these elevated boardwalks for you to be able to walk along. And during January, February, March, April, you know, the egrets and herons are all nesting and have chicks. And it's just, you know, it's warm weather. If you're getting out of the Allentown area weather, and <laughs> it's beautiful. To, and, and the mating plumage on these um, great egrets, you know, they have this green around the eye and they have these long willowy feathers. It's just, it's, it's eye candy for me. I love this bird. I have a 50 inch tall version of this bird in my bedroom. Is this another, like, what are you doing here for that? Like, this looks like another one of those low key photos to me. That's like the, everything else is very dark that really lets this white bird just jump out at you. Well, again, it is a white bird and, and it's bright sun down in Florida. So if you expose normal, you're going to blow mm -hmm. the lights on the bird. So um, what you have to do so that you don't blow the highlights on the bird is you have to underexpose. It varies, but anywhere from two to three stops. Oh, that um, much? Okay. But but you better be quick because once you decide to shoot a great blue heron or, or an anhinga, suddenly you got to move your exposure the other direction because it's a black bird against the green background. Mm. So, you know, I try to, I'm not successful always at this, but if you want to be a good photographer, you need to be able to adjust exposure compensation, shutter speed, ISO and F stop without removing your eye from the eyepiece. That way you can shift these things on the fly when things change. Uh, you know, right. it, yeah. the basic buttons are positioned on the camera so that this is not a difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and with mirrorless, you know, for many of the cameras, uh, you can see the histogram in your viewfinder. So you, you know, if you're blowing the, or, or you even get blinkies to where, you know, the overexposed areas become red or blue or whatever. Right. So, you know, adjust that exposure down until you don't have those blinkies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just spend the time like with the camera in your hand so that it's just a m matter of like muscle memory. Right. You just, right. I mean, the main system is, is, is incredibly deep and uh, you know, I'll admit, I don't know for sure how every function in, in that memory, in that menu system works. So I think about it long enough. I probably can, mm -hmm. but I definitely know how to set up my custom settings for pan. And mm -hmm. I say how to adjust exposure. I shoot mostly, people will ask this maybe, I shoot mostly manual, um, okay. auto ISO. And, um, oh, I, all right. and then I set a, a maximum that the ISO can go to. Um, mm -hmm. You know, with the uh, Olympus, I set it at 4,000. When I was shooting canvas, uh, Canon, it was 5,000. But I shoot auto ISO, um, and then I use exposure compensation to adjust things, you know, to, to my, you know, exposure. Right, right. Um, before I, I shot that way, I shoot aperture priority and I got good shots then too. Mm -hmm. uh, I just have a little bit more control now that I, in those days, auto ISO didn't exist. And, you know, gotcha. that's like, you know, opened up another dimension. You got shutter priority, aperture priority and ISO priority sort of, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I um, guess that really is kind of like if you're controlling aperture and shutter speed, but then ISO can still just float around on you. Exactly. Yeah. It's really a good way to shoot. And the only time I shoot shutter priority, again, is for my pan shots. Or mm -hmm. if I'm shooting birds and I know that I want to freeze it, so I know that I don't, that I need, let's say, a 1600th of a second or a 2000th of a second. Mm -hmm. and, and it's sun going in and out of the clouds or whatever. Then I'll shoot shutter priority then just to make sure that I, I, I keep the shutter speed up. But otherwise, I, I like manual and aperture priority. Interesting. And if you're a beginner, uh, mm -hmm. that P mode isn't the worst thing in the world. If you if you freak out and you're nervous, but you want to get the shot, you know, there's a lot of 
right. really, really smart guys over in Asia that came up with those algorithms for program mode, and it worked pretty <laughs> well. Yeah. This is again Florida. This is a, a portrait, you know, two mating um, great blue herons. Mm -hmm. Uh, I love it. Like there's just enough separation between the two of them there that they don't quite overlap. Yeah. Th That's this a really nice catch. Uh, this one is sharp. I also have plenty of them where I didn't have enough depth of field, by the way, because uh, you, again, you're close enough that you need to shoot F8 or F11 to make sure you get enough depth of field when you're this close to, to something with a telephoto lens. Mm -hmm. What kind of a lens choice are we looking at here as opposed to Africa? Like when you're doing birds, and especially in like South Florida. Well, in South Florida, again, the 100, 400 is plenty. Um, my my best friend, Joe, uh, always shot the 300 2.8 because he wanted a, a lot of bokeh. Mm -hmm. uh, and he manually zoomed by getting closer or walking further away. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, I used the 100, right. 400 when I was down there. And now, um, you know, the, the, the 4150 Olympus lens, which is 80 to 300 is what I use. Mm -hmm f 2.8 lens um the key for all my photography uh we were talking about high iso a while ago and we we're talking about low f stops things happen at the edge of the day early early morning late late afternoon and so that's when i do most of my shooting and so therefore i either need a fast lens meaning f 2.8 or f4 mm -hmm. or i need a high iso camera because you can't Compromise. You need the shutter speed you need to be able to get a sharp picture. Right. Right. And you're kind of like, yeah, then your light is limited. So something's got to give there, right? Yep. Yeah. This is another high key image. This is Blue Cypress Lake. It's an amazing lake in central Florida. Basically, they have these cypress wow. trees that are all out in the water. And the Spanish moss is just draping off of them. And 300 to 400 osprey each year come from South America to mate in these trees. No and we take these pontoon boats and float among the trees and, and photograph the, the, the birds. Um, it's, it's just beyond belief how many shots of birds. And it's a great place to learn birds in flight, by the way, is Florida, because these are big birds. They don't move that quickly. So mm -hmm. tracking them is not that difficult. But if I went to Blue Cypress Lake and just shot landscapes, I'd be a happy man. It is just that drop dead gorgeous. And then you add in all these osprey, and it's it's amazing. The osprey um, have laid eggs now. The, the chicks will be starting to raise their head above the nest in April. So so this is a location where, again, if I go there January, February, I get the parents mating and nest building. If I mm -hmm. go April, I get the chicks coming out of the nest. That's amazing. It's this such a, just a cool good. landscape, right? Like that, I don't know, like this... It's almost got this mythological look to it. Doesn't look real, even. I don't know how to describe that. Yeah, um, you know, there's a lot of photographers that say, and, and I'm beginning to learn, less is more. You know, photography is one of those things where you say, what can I exclude from the image? You want to keep it as simple as possible, as few elements as possible, and mm -hmm. it's going to work better for you. Busy pictures confuse the eye. So, you know, this was nice because you know this lone cypress was away from things. This bird was coming and going from that nest that's on the back side. And so we could just basically sit in the pontoon boat and wait for it to to come in to, to be with its mate. And then we'd go get some straw and then we'd come back again. Mm. This is the Jersey Shore. Um, I guess it's in probably about June. Um, you know, they have these um, these um, turns and they have oyster catchers and they have uh, you know, a number of, of great shorebirds. And again, um, it's, it's a great place to shoot. Uh, actually this, where is this? This, this is actually in New York state. I, I apologize. This is not in New Jersey. Um, it, it's near Jones beach, but regardless, they have these also in New Jersey. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, I shot it that way, but then I slowed down the shutter and shot it that way. You know, again, it's digital. So don't take a thousand shots just like this because they're all going to look alike after a while. Change mm -hmm. it up. Work the scene. You know, do that sense of place. Do the tight shot. You know, change the shutter speed. Do something to make all your pictures different. 
and that variety will be a better portfolio for you. That's a great idea. Like the, so you've got kind of a, okay, you've got kind of a list that you can work through rather yeah, than that's, that's trying to come up with something every time. Like this is always my list. I always use the same list in my mind. You know, mm -hmm. I've got this down to a science, you know, I get that safe shot. Then I look for interaction, actually look for action first. Mm -hmm. And then I, I usually say, okay, is the background interesting enough that I can get a sense of place? Okay. Let me get some tight shots. And then, you know, and I can get through those in, in two or three minutes, usually. I mean, because it's digital. You can move pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And then you can start getting creative and get the real good shots. Excellent. That's a great, great idea. Like, so so you're not always struggling with trying to come up with an idea. You kind of have that framework to build around. Right. I shot this oyster catcher first um, tight and at a high shutter speed. I then shot it... Um, with a slow shutter speed um, so that I got more motion with the, the wave as it receded each yeah. time. And, you know, luckily the bird stands still every once in a while. You can see that right foot is moving. So I'm mm -hmm. doing a, a minor bit of panning with him, but um, basically trying to keep my focus point on his eye. And I don't know, this is probably like a 30th of a second with birds. You got to be a little bit faster on your shutter speed when you pan because they're quicker. They're a little quicker. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a question that kind of speaks to that. And I think this is in reference to some of the Africa photos, but if you go there all the time, you have a chance to experiment because you're going to be there over and over again. As a first timer, how do you deal with experimenting when you know you have one or two shots to get a photo? That's why I always take the safe shot first. <laughs> There's always still places I haven't been or species I haven't seen yet. So yeah, I always get the safe shot. You can't go wrong having a good, like if this picture had, that water uh, totally in focus and sharp at let's say a thousandth of a second or whatever, it would still be a nice picture. It's got, you know, nice compositional elements to it. Um, mm -hmm. But once I have the safe shot, then I can say, okay, now let me play and try to get something a little, little, little riskier. Gotcha. So like you can be more comfortable about the experimenting because you know, you kind of got your safety net already. Like you right. got I've your got something to take home. So now yeah. I can, can start working on something interesting. Somebody mentioned a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this was uh, this summer. And mm -hmm. uh, every day when I was grilling, I noticed this squirrel running along this fence, this rail fence back behind my house. And the sun set directly behind my house. And uh -huh. this guy was glowing. You know, and every time he'd run past, he was just glowing. And uh, <laughs> the neighbor's deck is pretty dark. And then, so I thought, well, if I underexpose this thing enough that the neighbors and, you know, it's good. And that side of their house is in shadow to boot, then their house will just totally disappear. And I'll be able to get rim lighting on a, on a squirrel in my backyard. Um, and that's what I got. <laughs> and that's a, that's a real impressive picture of a animal that I've got a dozen of running around in my backyard. Yeah. You know, oh. one um, I don't think I included one with this particular presentation, but the bird that I think doesn't get enough respect is the Canada goose. You know, I mean, we see them so much. Nobody photographs Canada geese. It's, it's, you know, it's just, it's too common a bird, but mm -hmm. if you think about it, it's got all kinds of patterns and colors on it. And, you know, you get a nice yeah. background where, you know, uh, you know, it's a pleasant, pleasing background and you shoot, you know, a couple of those in formation flying past you. It's a gorgeous picture. You know, don't, don't think that you don't have anything to shoot. You can always shoot a goose at the golf course, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, that's, Oh, I do have geese. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> this is middle Creek a couple of years ago. Yeah. So, but I mean, so what time are you out there to get that fog on the lake? That mist really makes it shot. Just early morning, you know, the, the water was warmer than the air above it. And that's what caused that, that fog that morning. Um, mm -hmm. And again, that's that's a trick is is in wintertime, the bodies of water are often warmer than the air above them. And so you get that fog coming low on the water, which really adds mood. Bad weather means good photos. You know, I mentioned I'm going to go in April to Kenya and it's mm -hmm. going to be raining and it's going to be miserable. We're not going to have a good time, but we're going to get some powerful photos because of that rain. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the stuff that wins awards. You know, a pleasant picture of a beautiful day with a lion sitting there it's not going to win a competition. It's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a nice picture. I'm, I would shoot it. Don't get me wrong. I've got lion pictures all around me here in this room, but, um, 
but bad weather means good pictures. Yeah, that's and that's a thing that I tell people in class all the time. When the weather gets weird, grab your camera. Like there's yeah. going to be interesting clouds. There's going to be the light's going to get strange. Exactly. Uh, again, this is shot over in the Easton area. Um, there's um, Bushkill Park or something like that. Um, oh, yeah. There's a, a little stream that runs next to it. And it seems yep. like there's a little there's wood ducks there. Yeah. And, and notice, by the way, I, I saw some pictures of this these wood duck from friends of mine that stood at the top of the, of the hill by the car and photographed downward into the water. Mm-hmm. And they were nice shots, but this one's more powerful because I climbed down on the rocks and got down closer to water level to try to I photograph the bird. Um, I would have liked to have gotten lower, but you know I didn't want to slip and break my neck. So safety <laughs> first, but um, but the low angle adds depth to the picture. Yeah, you can get like you're right down there on their eye level, making eye contact with them, right? And that's really yeah. like if you can connect with the eye in the photo. Exactly. Yeah. I love river beds. And, you know, people want to photograph their dog or their cat. Um, and, you know, I've got my girlfriend photographs her dog all the time, standing above it and shooting it when it's right over here. And mm -hmm. it's, it's messy. And then I, I lay down on my stomach and photograph it. And, of course, it comes and wants to lick me or whatever. But I get a shot or two before it gets there. Right. <laughs> you know, um, that lower angle is a better picture. It's just that simple. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And by the way, with reticulated screens on the cameras, even older people like me can get lower <laughs> easier because we can lower the camera below us and tilt the screen to still be able to see on live view what it is we're shooting. So yeah. no excuses, folks. <laughs> like I'm perfectly happy to lie down on the ground in order to get a shot unless it's like there's a Money. mud puddle there and I don't yeah. really feel like it, right? Exactly. But again, you know, you can get extremely low with your camera. You, you know, your arms are pretty long and you just bend over a little bit. You got your angle. Yeah. Oh, I added a couple extras in case we had extra time. Do we have time or not? I, I'm okay. I want to look at pictures. Okay. Uh, these are, this is Namibia again. This is the Tosha National Park. Um, and again, the, the, the curvature of the, the stream. Did it for me. The background there is a salt pan that's, probably about 20 miles long and it's just white salt pan nothing there during the winter months their rains come in november and december and then they don't get rain again until the next november so by july water sources are thin the animals really mm -hmm. congregate around anywhere there's a what they call a borehole which basically is a man-made well or a natural spring this happens to be a natural spring mm -hmm. And this particular water hole, by the way, I refer to when we're on safari as the killing field. There's a pride of lions that are always here. They're usually in the bush right behind where my vehicle is sitting in this picture. And that ground around this water hole is just littered with bones. <laughs> they definitely wow. catch things there. Oh, man. <laughs> like everybody's got to drink water. So they got it. And I guess it's easy pickings for the lions then. And it's circle of life. I mean, you know, I, I don't. Yeah. Everybody wants to see, not everybody, a lot of people want to see a kill occur on these safaris. Mm -hmm. the, the hunt is exciting. The kill itself is not as exciting. It's more drawn out than you would think. Basically, they put a chokehold on the animal and eventually the animal suffocates. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition, animals feeding um, are a little bit gory. So um, <laughs> people want to stop and look at it, but, but you're not going to put on your wall a picture of, of an animal that's got red blood on its face or something right mm -hmm. um i tell people if you're going to shoot that you know consider getting in really really tight and look for details you know like the gnawing teeth on a piece of meat or the eyes of the lion or something but the kills are not really the best shots not super photogenic i guess no i mean everybody wants to see one i, I like seeing them too i love to see the hunt but mm -hmm. and i know that animals have to eat so it doesn't bother me at this stage yeah um that's this, cool I'm in a riverbed, a dry riverbed driving along, and there's a big um, sort of a sand dune up above me, and mm -hmm. there's not much vegetation in this area, so the only thing that can go there is the giraffe pretty much, and as you can see, he even has to reach to get the food, so mm -hmm. uh, again, I would consider this a sense of place shot, you know, or it's a landscape sort of kind of a thing, mm -hmm. you know, the animal is, is secondary to the whole composition for me. Right, but it's got such a great storytelling sort of quality to it. Yeah, right? like it's the narrative much. here. 
Yep. This is a place I went to for a first time last year. This is Champoli Wilderness. And it's um, in the Great Rift Valley, uh, right on the Kenya-Tanzania border. And it's so remote that there's no tourism there, basically. The place I stayed has four chalets. Um, so they could accommodate maybe eight people, but there's nothing else for 30 or 40 miles. So what you get there are like the Maasai people who are herders, mm -hmm. you know, they don't see white people that often. And so they're, it's not a tourist type thing, but it's a photo thing because watching them bring the cattle in at night and the dust that's being stirred up because it's so dry there and the dust devils in the distance. And um, it's just a beautiful place to photograph. And there's like, wow. say, virtually no tourism. So you have it to yourself which is really neat. That sounds amazing. Yeah. By the way, this one also, um, those uh, zebras were, they weren't out of focus, but they were, I shot this with pretty strong thermals because it was a hot day. Oh, okay. I took, so I took this image into that DXO software and used their sharp, no, excuse me, Topaz shop software and used Topaz Sharpen on this mm -hmm. and, um, and did that as a layer and mask out everything else except for the the zebras. And it came out fabulous. I mean, you can see in the background how crunchy things look from the thermals, mm -hmm. but the zebras in the foreground are, are, they they cleaned up really nice with topaz. And that's the one that like helps from eliminate, it's not just sharpen, it was like camera shake or something it'll, like it'll it'll just, yeah, It'll just focus uh, to, to a little degree, although you can't make a sharp picture sharp that didn't. Right, right. Um, It'll sharpen it, and it'll also um, uh, minimize camera shake a little bit. It, it yeah. has like three modules that, that, that you can pick from, and um, you just sort of click them and see which one suits your fancy. Mm -hmm. And on that software, you know, I've talked about not using presets. I just hit auto, and whatever it comes up with, I go with. It seems to <laughs> make a pretty good selection for you. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I was. I that was one of the ones that I've just like download the free trial. Eh, let's see what, like, if the advertising actually, yeah, it's actually pretty darn good. Yeah, it is. I had a, I actually won that software. Um, the uh, Lehigh Valley Photography Club, which I encourage everyone to join, uh, meets once a month in Bethlehem, non-COVID period, and has also workshops, et cetera. But we also, at um, Allentown Art Museum, once a year, have a gallery show, and we get people like Dan's camera to donate gifts. Topaz donated a number of software things and Olympus is always very generous at their donations to that event. And um, I did not win for that picture you, you liked so much of Kilimanjaro over the elephants, but I mm -hmm. did place, I, I think, I, you know, I can't remember what I want exactly, but, and one of my prizes was that Topaz software. Not bad. Yeah. <laughs> but to not win <laughs> in the local competition and win that. <laughs> But that, that, and again, let me tell everybody, if your camera club has competitions, you're not going to win every week, but you're going to get feedback from the judges every week. You know, so enter the competitions for the feedback and, mm -hmm. you know, just to share what you've shot and how much you love it. It's not about the prizes and the wins. It's about the feedback that you get, you know, the, the critiques uh, that grows your, your skill. I remember, um, Again, back in about 2008 or so, there was a, a website called Bite Photo that every week, you know, they had a photo competition and and you got feedback from your peers and they also gave it a one to 10 score as well as some comments. And I used to get crushed. I mean, I felt so bad about the scores I was getting. But, you know, after I got over the, the, the feeling so bad about it, uh -huh. you know, I read the comments and thought about what they were saying and, and I just started growing with regard to getting feedback as to what maybe I might want to try differently the next time I shot that scene. You don't have mm -hmm. to agree. It's, it's one person's opinion, but right. it's feedback and it's free. So take it. That's a great idea. Yeah. And like, if you're looking for ways to kind of improve, getting input from somebody who is not you is probably not a bad way to do that. Yeah. I did a book. I used blurb and, and did a book um, and I'm going to start using, I think you do the Canon HD. Uh, books at bands. Mm -hmm. Those look yeah. pretty good. I'm going to have to try one of those. But anyway, I did a book and I included this picture uh, because, again, growing up in the in a, uh, on a farm setting and having horses, mm -hmm. our horses would roll over. My dad always said, if he can roll over, he's worth a hundred dollars. 
<laughs> so you know, this is just a zebra out in the field rolling over, you know, scratching his back and getting some dust on his back. Uh -huh. uh, I thought it, it sort of typified the scene that I was seeing. My girlfriend hates this picture, but I love it. Really? It takes me home. It takes me back to, the, to you know, to South Carolina. It's got such a sense of personality. And it's got good right. separation between the animals. Yeah. You know? It's a good picture. <laughs> <laughs> I get hey, don't listen to her. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, mean, I was mentioning rule of thirds, and you don't always have to have rule of thirds. I'm totally good with, with symmetry if it pleases the eye. Mm -hmm. And one of the shots, uh, there's a book called Africa by a man named Michael Paliza. Um, he's a, a German fellow that lives in South Africa now. And this book is 11 by 14 and about an inch thick. It must have 300 photos in it. And when I first was getting into wildlife photography, that was my Bible. I could just sit and flip through those photos day after day. And one of them that he had that I always wanted to emulate was a picture of a draft bending over drinking water like this. Because I've seen it a thousand times, but shooting it was very difficult. Finding, you know, one that you could get right in front of and get the angle and everything else. Right. So yeah, okay. I was so pleased when I got this shot. And this one also was a finalist with... Um, with nature's best photography uh, photo competition. Um, but yeah, and, and then when they lift up, the water comes, that they're drinking at that moment, sort of comes out of their mouth and creates this little S pattern. It's also really a cool shot. Oh, neat. But you need to be more of a side angle to get that one. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wow. <laughs> love when you see something like an elephant trying to reach to get something he can't quite reach. Mm-hmm. And yeah, this is storytelling. You can yeah. call it a portrait. You can call it a safe shot. But it's all the above. You can mix the genres. That it's not one or the other. It can be and. Yeah. Again, it's that that narrative. There's storytelling. There's like the personality of the animal. It's not just standing there. It's doing something. The gesture, I think, is what you were talking about. Yeah, and the bulls are the only ones that are tall enough to reach these branches at this particular location. So they shake these trees, and and seed pods come down. And then the rest of the herd suddenly comes and joins to eat those seed pods. And I think that's the bull's way to find a mate because <laughs> definitely he starts off alone. And definitely when he's successful, the other elephants come to join him. Okay. Seems like a solid strategy. <laughs> yeah. This was a lucky shot. I was, um, and John Hunt, if you're still on, this is the shot you did not get. He decided to go home early, and I stayed a few more days. This is the zebra migration, which most people don't know exists. The zebras in July and August and September migrate from the Makati-Kati pans and Nai pans of Botswana that have gone bone dry to the Boteti River, which is near the Okavango Delta. And so 30 or 40,000 zebra do that migration to get to water. And I wanted to see that event because I had seen it on a Nat Geo movie. So I went there to photograph the zebra migration and the lodge was just across the Boteti River from the area that they migrate to. So this was at the end of the day and we're just crossing the river to get back to our lodge. And I turn and here's this golden light and this elephant bathing himself right beside us practically. And I'd already put packed my camera away. I have never got a camera out of a bag so quickly. <laughs> <off the line. laughs> I mean, I just, I love this picture personally. I don't know if it works for you or not. But that low oh, angle yeah. eye of the elephant, which is hard always to get. Uh -huh. you know, the, the, a little bit of reflection in the water. I, yeah, the light, the the composition, the just the, uh, you get a sense of the mass of them here. Yeah. By the way, cool trivia fact about uh, Minaquina, which is the name of this particular lodge. The chalet I stayed in at this lodge is the chalet that uh, Harry... Uh, proposed to Megan at. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. The royals are, both the brothers are, are real big supporters of Africa. They donate a lot of money, and Botswana is their favorite country in particular. And they huh. spend a lot of time there. No kidding. Yeah, trivia. And so I guess uh must be a pretty classy place. It was very nice. It's uh, <laughs> no power, so they cook, you know, cook everything over an open fire. They have like a stove top that, that they put over the open fire. Um, mm -hmm. Very eco-friendly. Um, they heat water by the fire and then put it in a pot up above you. And then when you go to shower, you just pull the rope and the water cascades down on you. And um, 
um, it got chilly at night, but they have uh, thermoses of hot water they put under your bedspread before you get to your room. And so you, you get under the covers and it's warm as toast. It was a very nice place. This oh, is wow. called neck fighting. These are two male uh, giraffe, and they're having a dominance fight. They basically wildly swing their necks at each other, trying to beat each other up. And then the one that gives up, you know, doesn't get to mate, and the one that wins does get to mate. Wow. And not really important, but trivia, you can tell if it's a male giraffe um, a couple of ways. First off, looking underneath them. But um, if you look at the, the ossicones, which most people call horns, mm -hmm. if they're, notice the ones on the, that top one. They're totally bald and they're not hairy. Um, the males have bald ossicones and the females have hairy ossicones. So oh. just by looking at the head, you can quickly tell if it's a male or a female. What is going on with the color palette in that one? It's such a, like, it's a little more muted than some of your other ones. Is it, is that just time of day? Is it? It's time like, of day. Oh, yeah. Okay. It, it's, it's actually in the afternoon, but in the very early, it, the midday part of the afternoon, we, we had just gone out. Um, this was on that same trip I mentioned earlier where Shirley and Michelle were in the vehicle with me. And um, this was at Nematoni, which is in Atosha uh, on the far Eastern side of, of the park. Almost every picture I have, and this is the thing that tells me how much I love being there, I can pretty much tell you where it was, what day it was, what trip it was, what year it was. You know, I can remember each of these things. And when I look at my pictures and like somebody asked, do I do much editing? I do a lot. And I do a lot because it takes me back to that moment when I was there. I, I get to relive the trip three or four times through editing the pictures. This is, uh, uh, again, these are uh, will be so we're more uniformly moving right to left. This was my first day ever in the Masamara. And um, I don't know why these were running, but there was a small herd and they were running past. And again, I had one of my custom settings set at like a 30th of a second and just flipped it to it and started panning with the animals. I like pan shots. You'll find on Facebook pan shots do not get as many comments and feedback notes as pictures of, let's say, baby uh, anything, baby elephants, baby monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> but in competitions, as well as uh, just for your own personal technical satisfaction that you pulled one off, pan mm -hmm. shots are very rewarding. And I shoot for me, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, like Facebook is tough because most people are looking at it like this big right? as you it. scroll past on your phone for half a second. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Facebook is not the place to get, you know, I talked about the importance of feedback and part of mm -hmm. why you get competitions is to hear what the judges have to say. Camera clubs are great for that. Facebook is not because you're going to get your aunts and uncles and cousins all saying great shot. They're never going to say, mm -hmm. uh, did you consider changing the angle of that shot? Or, you know, you're definitely <laughs> too shallow. You know, you're just not going to get that. Right. Yeah, so I guess you, how long did it take you to get comfortable, like, putting yourself out there like that? Uh, as I mentioned, early on, I was crushed. I remember I took a picture of a group of moms that I thought was quite pretty. <laughs> and there was a gap in the moms where they weren't solid flower the whole way across. And, and you know, they were saying, you know, I don't know why you posted this. You should only post your better stuff. And I'm like, that is my better stuff. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> but again, I, I've just gotten used to it. There's clearly a lot of people that like my stuff, but there's also clearly a lot of people that I can pretty much guarantee. My buddy Don, for example, I won't even mention his last name. I don't think I've ever shown him a picture where he can't tell me something I can improve on that picture. And I love mm -hmm. that about him because he's a very good photographer and his feedback is information farming. So, you know, it, it, you just got to get past it. You got to just kind of set your ego aside there a little bit and be willing to take that kind of exactly. take the hit. <laughs> exactly. I mean, if you look online at pro photographers, every style finds certain people that like it and every style finds people who don't like it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just have to find your niche. And as long as you're pleased with what you're shooting, you know, have confidence in yourself. That's the last one. Sorry. <laughs> so that's oh, it. That's great. Uh, again, you right. can find me on Facebook um, or Instagram. Okay. Uh, visit my website. It's a little out of date because I need to update some of the trips due to COVID. But um, yeah, please, by all means, like 
go follow buddy go follow magnum excursions we've got a link to them on our website i know you're actually uh kind of active in our facebook group as well that's a great place yeah. to kind of connect with you and All by right. the way uh, on your on your group as well as on my own pages often when i post a picture i'll either give a little story about why the picture spoke to me or i'll give some information about how i set up the camera and why i use those settings and so you know it's a, it's a i try to give people helpful information with my photography that's fantastic it's always great when somebody's willing to take the, a little bit of extra time to kind of share that like here's what was going on here was my thought process here's how i shot this yeah so yeah we definitely appreciate it it's always great to hear from you yeah well i enjoy doing okay. it hey john still is here <laughs> <laughs> He's actually found a nest of bald eagles down where he lives, and he told me he wasn't going out to shoot the eagles today because he wanted to hear me. I told him this could be recorded. He could hear it later. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's going to about wrap it up for this week. Um, again, like we've got your links up there. I'll post links in the uh, in the notes below uh, so that we've got all your links there that people can click on. Uh, buddy, thanks so much for joining us tonight. This has been a blast. Uh, your pictures are great. It's always great to sit around and talk about this stuff with you. Yeah, well, I enjoy doing it. As you can tell, I, I really love wildlife and I love photography. So to me, it's just, you know, getting to share what I do. Oh, yeah, clearly. Like, just to hear you talk about it, you're clearly, like, very passionate, very dedicated to the subject and the animals. Yeah, well, it is. It's 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 my thing these days. What can I say? Yeah. Again, he thanks for having me on. Absolutely. It's been great. All right. So, uh join us again next week we will have bob becker the president of the lehigh valley photo club who uh i think you already gave a little plug here <laughs> so if you're not already aware of the lehigh valley photo club and all the great things that they have to offer join us next week uh and we'll chat with bob about all the uh all the stuff that they're doing um, and they going on. yeah they've done a great job during the pandemic yeah absolutely keep your camera dry good advice <laughs> All right. That's about going to do it for us. Thanks again for joining us for the Wednesday night photo show. Um, get out there and take some pictures. Practice on the squirrels. Practice on the, the rabbits and the birds that your bird feed are in your backyard. Yeah. And then uh, maybe someday you can make it to Africa and, or South Florida or Yellowstone in the middle of the winter. <laughs> All right. Thanks again. Bye. Good night.